Hello, welcome. Thank you for waiting. All right, as I try to get down the names. So this week we are doing the era of alleged Jacksonian democratization, a time in which uh, society was allegedly uh, democratized in some ways politically and culturally. And um, it had a downside to it though, didn't it? I don't know if you've had a chance yet to read it, read this week's, uh, but of course it is a bit uh, cynical about Jackson's time period. All right, so let me get all these names down. This is great. We had a great turnout. All right. And so uh, are there any questions? Any questions thus far? You guys doing okay? Thank you, Jolene. All right, I think I have everyone's name. All right, for your extra credit for this assignment. Let's get right into the, um, the handout. All right, and so um, let's see here. I can move this mouse up. All right, so I have democracy, be careful what you wish for, right? And democracy, right, is literally ruled by the, the demos, the people in Greek. And so uh, we still have a republic. We have a constitutional federal republic, as you recall. Um, but it supposedly became a little bit more democratic, uh, as it's supposed to be a, a blend of aristocracy, monarchy, and democracy. And so uh, when you look at this time period, um, the, one of the first people I think of like culturally is uh, Alexei de Tocqueville. Alexei de Tocqueville wrote um, uh, his musings on, um, on this generation of Americans as an outsider, right? And it was called um, Democracy in America. Now, like number one, like this section that you're doing, uh, it's not all good, what he has in his famous classic book. Um, but, but he was impressed in some ways uh, with this generation, uh, if for no other reason, just being anomalous, out of the ordinary, uh, compared to Europe at least, right? And so in, in what way? Well, the first thing he says is arguable, and, and historians like Edward Pesson uh, disagree uh, with the stats that they're able to uh, get together. Uh, but he contends the first thing that struck him in amongst Americans was their general equality of condition. Uh, he said that Americans by and large were largely in the same economic class, not too poor, not too rich, uh, but just kind of burgeoning um, uh, would be uh, entrepreneurs, mainly by entrepreneur, I mean cash crop farmers. Uh, but he said that he'd never seen anything like it, that the common American expected to become rich. Uh, he has kind of a funny quote where he says, uh, Americans will be begin building a cabin on a slot of land. And before the roof is finished, they're not satisfied and they want something bigger and better. And they move further west and to build a, a bigger cabin on a bigger plantation, etc. And so, uh, and, and he stated that when they see someone better off than they, uh, than they are, uh, they, there's a sense of, of, of resentment and also, also almost a sense of entitlement, uh, like, hey, I ought to be as rich as you are, and uh, it'll be just a matter of time, and I will be such. And so he was very surprised by this. Um, 
And he likened it to the availability of plentiful land compared to France, uh, how you know contiguously big the boundaries are to the United States by this time. Uh, and of course, they'll only get bigger uh, in time. Uh, but um, he contended that there's just a sense of, of, of egalitarianism amongst Americans, that they all think that they're just as special as anybody else and that they're entitled to the good life and they expect it. And they expect their politicians to afford it to them and offer that to them, uh, the, a taste of the good life, of the, of the good old fashioned American dream, right? Socioeconomic ascension. And so at any rate, uh, he says that they, they are against deference. Uh, remember, deference is knowing your place and uh, to your, uh, your social and political and cultural uh, uh, betters, if you will, superiors, that that was anathema here in the U.S. Uh, he ha there's a famous anecdote where a, a gentleman uh, is um, interrupted by another man who cuts in front of him into a, a, some type of, of public accommodation. And um, the gentleman says, don't you know who I am? I'm the marquee of this, of that, and I own this much wealth and land, et cetera, et cetera. And the American tells him, that might be something special where you're from. This is a loose paraphrase. Uh, but here in America, that doesn't mean anything. And spit tobacco on his foot and proceeded to walk in front of him into the institution, into the, into the uh, whatever business it was. And so at any rate, uh, you know, that's, that's Alexei de Tocqueville's uh, take on Americans is that they're very egalitarian. Everyone's on equal footing, uh, almost literally. Uh, and again, that, that point has been contested by revisionist historians uh, who contend that there was a gap between wealthy and rich, but that the, the poor, the poor white demographic uh, of males uh, expected to become rich in their lifetime, that there was a great feeling of, of like I said, almost entitlement and expectation that they were going to get a taste of the good life in this age of Andrew Jackson's reign, uh, largely 18, he was, um, uh, uh, he won office in 1832 and eight, 1828 and 1832. And so, um, or wait, was it 1832 and 1836? Shame on me. Uh, but at any rate, the Jacksonian time period is roughly the end of the 1820s and most of the 1830s, the beginning up through the mid 1830s. And um, that's what we're talking about here. And so uh, as preceded by the so-called era of good feelings when there was just one political party. Uh, but at any rate, um, getting into the politics, what changed? Uh, well, the direct election of presidential electors, uh, the nominating system for candidates uh, entered the convention phase, whereby if you joined a political party, uh, any average Joe could run for office uh, now. They democratized the process of, of, of candidacy. Um, they uh, tried to do away with the Electoral College. Um, they had a lot of pageantry, uh, literally a lot of parades. Uh, economic participation just skyrocketed. I mean, look at this right here. Those who voted for a presidential candidate rose, according to Alan Brinkley's textbook, uh, look at that, rose from 26.9% of eligible voters going to the polls to vote for president in 1824 to 80.2% in the election of 1840 when William Henry Harrison was elected president. And so that's amazing, right? The, the degree of, of political participation in politics. Now, beyond voting, uh, joining parades, uh, going to these, um, these rallies in which uh, they had uh, qu questions addressed to the candidates and they would have debate with one another you know, the degree to which the average person was really dictating things and really participating in politics has been contested, right? Uh, the argument is, is who was really running the show? Uh, one of the arguments in, in the historiography of this time period is who's really running the show, the politicians who were elected time and time again, like Andrew Jackson, uh, or their voters. And of course, according to Andrew Jackson, he's going to contend that the people are in charge. Uh, and he's going to use that rationale uh, a popular term that he used and has been used since is uh, the term popular mandate, all right? Says like the Spanish mandato uh, is a command, right? 
So he's going to say, I have a popular mandate. The people, the majority of citizens want this or want that, and therefore I'm going to provide it for them. And so a lot of the decisions that he made, technically, uh, you know, it's hard to say because they don't have Gallup polls at this time, but by the election, when, when, when um, you know, uh, uh, politicians would make it clear, and they didn't always do so, uh, what they stood for in their platform, and they were continually elected and reelected, that says something as far as the popularity of their platform. Um, he seemed to make decisions that were popular, but you have to remember is, um, and another thing that, that was democratized was uh, property requirements for voting and running for office were uh, largely dropped in, in almost all the states. And so now uh, poor sharecroppers, poor renters, and those who didn't own land uh, could, could vote and run for office, all right? But we're still talking about predominantly because of the statistics on immigration, and census reports, et cetera, you're still largely dealing with uh, the, the citizenry, right? You're still talking about a WASP demographic, a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. And matter of fact, I'll add one more term there, uh, WASP male, because of course women were disenfranchised, Native Americans were disenfranchised, um, it was uh, up to each state, even though uh, under Article 1, Section 8, it's up to Congress as far as naturalization for immigrants. Uh, but we're predominantly talking about WASP male citizens, all right, uh, who, are, who are supposedly running the show, according to Andrew Jackson and the politicians who were elected time and time again. Well, one thing that, that does, you know, arguably limitedly suggest there was an uh, element to that that the people, the average citizen was running the show was the fact of how many offices now became elect elective, uh, local sheriffs, judges even now, um, and uh, more direct representation and voting for presidents and presidential candidates and more people voting for them, et cetera. But you also have um, the, uh, the fact that, that you have here peasant sites that that oftentimes they would not, um, they would not make a definitive stand on their platform until they figured out that something was popular or not. So, for example, some people learned it the hard way. Um, you see here, Andrew Jackson had a tougher stance against Native Americans, and that that seems to have been more of a popular. It it entailed more uh, votes for Andrew Jackson actually being anti-Native American. Uh, than him, more so than Henry Clay in his platform. And John Quincy Adams, the son of John Adams, the second president, um, as the sixth president, he, uh, he was an abolitionist, uh, which was anomalous at that time period. And that cost him a lot of pro-slavery voters votes. And so um, what were some of the things that Andrew Jackson embraced in his platform that seemed to have been popular? Well, one that I mentioned that, that's really salient in this handout is his anti-Native American stance, right? Uh, the desire to, to make Native Americans, uh, to, to punish them, uh, not only in the War of 1812, but in the Seminole Wars down in, in the Florida area uh, in the 18-teens, around 1817 to 1819. Uh, the Seminole, they had a couple Seminole Wars, and it was actually popular uh, what he did. And what he did was, was constitutionally dubious. Um, he began attacking not only, uh, quote, Negro runaway slave forts, um, he not only gave ultimatums to Seminole chiefs who did not take the ultimatums kindly and do, did not respond in an obsequi obsequious way, uh, but he also began eventually attacking Spanish cities and forts. And Florida was, was, was possessed sovereignly by Spain. It was claimed by Spain at this time. And we're going to arguably bully it from Spain in the Seminole Wars and getting a muscling a treaty from Spain to, uh, to sell or cede uh, Spanish Florida to uh, the United States. But that actually, it seems as if that was a popular cause. 
Uh, I mentioned the Fort Mims massacre uh, during the War of 1812, and there were other massacres as well in 1817 against uh, WASP pioneers. And the press, they did their part in flaming anti-Native American sentiment. And then, of course, you have the irony in this handout that the, the quote, civilized tribes, like the Cherokee, Choctaw, and Creek, and others, right? They embraced, they, they assimilated to a large degree. Uh, they invited missionaries to begin schools for their Native American children, many of whom became Christian. Uh, they devised their own alphabet. They became uh, private landowners and cash crop farmers, in some cases, even slave owners uh, themselves, the Native Americans. Uh, they uh, received the land from the federal government to begin with and were, had it granted to them. And they even had a constitutional um, republic uh, uh, known as uh, Ishota, uh, E-C-H-O-T-A uh, of the Cherokee uh, in the Georgia and Carolinas uh, areas. And it, it was already decided uh, under the Articles of Confederation, and it was cemented by a couple important um, uh, judicial decisions that Native Americans were to be treated as a sovereign people, a sovereign nation within the nation, but that they were directly wards of the state, W-A-R-D-S. And if the ward of the state is like an orphan uh, or a, a prison inmate, you are directly under the, the protection um, of the federal government. Uh, but, but it implies that you're exempt from certain state, for the Native Americans, from certain state uh, laws. Uh, so to this day, it's, it, that stands. Uh, Native Americans who live on reservations, they're in a special uh, constitutionally uh, categorized you know, uh, category. And um, although in the 1920s, they were granted uh, the rights of citizenship. So that at least happened. But still, you know, that's why they could have casinos in California when, where gambling is illegal. Uh, they have their own uh, kind of special jurisdiction when they live on reservations uh, directly under the federal government. And so at any rate, it's bittersweet. Um, and you see the bitter part of it here in this section, right? Uh, because the states are going to issue uh, eminent domain laws against the Cherokee and other tribes. Uh, forcing them to sell their lands to the state so they could offer it to their voters because the voters coveted their lands. And um, when they did so, the Cherokee in particular uh, were re well represented by a, a lawyer named William uh, Wirt, I think it was, W-I-R-T. And um, he is going to argue that a, uh, a national uh, treaty that granted them the land of Ashota, um, that, that that national treaty trumps a state law that says they have to sell that same land. And the, and the Supreme Court actually sided with the Cherokee and stated in the Worcester case uh, that um, the Native Americans did not have to sell their lands, uh, that they had been granted it by a, um, a federal treaty, and that federal treaty trumped the state uh, eminent domain laws that were trying to force them to sell that land. Andrew Jackson steps in and unilaterally defies the Supreme Court's decision and says, it is the mandate of the people. This is what the people of Georgia and the Carolinas want, and that's therefore that's what they're going to get. And he also issued paternalistic rhetoric uh, that's going to be very common in the 1800s, that Native Americans were unassimilable. Uh, they were unwilling and unable to assimilate fully, which is ironic, right, in light when you read about the five civilized tribes and how, how to the degree to which they did effectively assimilate at the, in the 1820s and early 1830s. Uh, but it contends that they're unassimilable. And being that they are like oil and water, they and WASP America, that conflict would become inevitable, unavoidable. And, and they would inevitably lose uh, just by numbers and technological inferiority alone that they would lose. So therefore he was moving them for their own protection and for their own good. And because it was the will of the people uh, to, to, to get their land. Um, and it, it resulted in the infamous trails of tears, right? 
and uh, where they forced them into Arkansas and Oklahoma on uh, an Indian territory on reservations. So that ironically was a popular decision that Andrew Jackson did. But notice what he's doing is he, he's pulling a lot of unilateral weight as the president, right? He's acting, you know, arguably like a demagogue, a manipulator of the people. And a demagogue, right, uh, claims to be one of the people, uh, uh, knows what buttons to push of the people as far as what they love, what they hate, uh, what they're intolerant toward, what their prejudices are against, uh, what their desires entail, and offers those things to them, right? Contending that he's not being an autocrat, but that he's mer merely been given a, quote, popular mandate, that uh, he's doing what the people want, right? But when in reality, he's for his own aggrandizement. He's for the, the, the development of his own power uh, as a politician. And he fit the formula perfectly. Uh, that was a way by which the politicians catered to the, the voters. Is they, It's called um, log, cabin camp, log cabin campaigning in Alan Brinkley's textbook, where you try to uh, present yourself as an average poor, uh, non-elitist American who grew up poverty-stricken and became a self-made man, right? Uh, became wealthy, became powerful by your own merit. You pulled yourself up by your own bootstraps, right? Good old American rugged individualism. And, um, and you try to win votes that way, right? So you see that with presidents, right? Who, um, they might, you know, drive a Chevy truck and wear a cowboy hat and say and, and talk with the, the the vernacular of the common American, and contend that he that they're one of them. Uh, but you know, in reality, you have to be careful if they're looking out for their own um, empowerment, as opposed to doing what the people want them to do. But of course, this is it's not cut and dry in that way, because of course you can't take at face value. Uh, what presidents state in writing and in their speeches, because of course it could be very um, artificial, right? It could be very insincere. But with that having been said, uh, when a lot of that rhetoric that they give is backed up by actions, there might be a degree to which the reality is a little bit messy, where they, they might be a bit like demagogues, but they also might simultaneously truly believe they're doing the right thing in, in bringing about the will of the majority of citizens, right? That, that, and, and you find that with Andrew Jackson. And matter of fact, Andrew Jackson oftentimes uses terms like heaven, providence, uh, the almighty. Uh, so he almost couched it in religious terms, right? In spiritual terms and saying that the, the will of the majority of citizen, citizens is God's will, and therefore he's following God's mandate, if you will, by following the popular mandate of what the majority of citizens want. And so it's an interesting topic. Uh, but notice, right, who, uh, who uh, suffers from this democratization politically and culturally? Uh, the numerical minority, right? Those who are not a part of the majority of citizens. Those who are marginalized, kicked to the corner, uh, uh, excluded, right? So women, uh, a uh, Asian and Hispanic Americans, um, African Americans to be certain, uh, Native Americans, they're not included in, these included in these majority decisions. So you think about it, right? I, I mean, imagine, you know, theoretically, if you're following the idea of popular sovereignty and democracy, and you think of our class becoming marooned on an island and uh, our, our living circumstances are very precarious. We don't know what we're gonna be able to, to hunt and, and fish for for food and sustenance. And let's say there are 30 of us and 16 or 17, which constitutes the majority of the 30, right? 50% uh, plus one, uh, 16 or 17 of us decide to enslave the other 13 or 14. Well, that's what the majority wanted, right? So as I stated in here at the end, I believe, uh, some critics contend that democracy can be like two wolves and one lamb voting for what's for dinner. And of course, you know that the two wolves are gonna outvote the lamb 
and, and vote to eat the lamb. And so the Native Americans were devoured by majoritarian uh, politics at this time, right? Because they were excluded. And so that's why I have it on the title here, be careful what you ask for uh, with democratic government. Uh, another demographic that was kind of marginalized uh, were the East Coast wealthy people, especially those connected to banking and, and creditors, lenders, money lenders. Uh, they were seen as, um, as um, parasites, right? And so hence, uh, it was political suicide uh, to run for office with any kind of elitist platform or elitist uh, self-identity, right? So like John Quincy Adams, he had several strikes against him. He was born into old wealth, into old Massachusetts wealth. Uh, he, everybody knew who his daddy was as far as being the second president and being a very conservative uh, second president. And he had been educated in Europe and had traveled because of his dad's money. He was able to become very cosmopolitan and travel the world and become very educated. Uh, he was granted uh, um, uh, posts in the presidential cabinets before uh, becoming president. And, um, and then the fact that, that he won uh, by not getting a majority of, of votes in 1824, I believe it was, um, he ran against the, the man of the people, Andrew Jackson, and um, no one received a majority of the electoral points. Uh, but it, although Andrew Jackson received a plurality, he, he received the most. So technically he won, but yet you have to have a majority. You have to have over 50% of the electoral points. So when that doesn't happen, the Constitution states that it goes to the House. The House decided on the second place guy, who was John Quincy Adams. And it became known as the corrupt bargain when he put Henry Clay as his new secretary of state. And Henry Clay was the speaker of the House and kind of ensured that the House voted for uh, John Quincy Adams instead of Andrew Jackson. So it was known as a corrupt bargain and it did him in for the following election when Andrew Jackson is going to overwhelmingly beat him in popular votes and electoral points. And, you know, to the contrary, Andrew Jackson was Scots-Irish, and they were seen as scum of the earth as recently as the War for Independence, when North Carolina said, uh, Scots-Irish, you're not welcome here. Keep traveling through the Appalachians into Ken Tennessee and Kentucky. Um, he was orphaned by the time he was 14. His dad died in a logging accident when his mother was pregnant with him, and his mother died during the War for Independence, as did one or two of his brothers. And so, uh, you know, he was poor, he was orphaned. He fits this bill for log cabin campaigns perfectly, right? And then he rose up um, the old fashioned way of, of becoming a land speculator uh, and a land surveyor, I'm sorry, a land surveyor, he did become a land speculator later, a land surveyor, also a, um, a slave trader uh, briefly, and also um, a cash crop farmer, and then ultimately a lawyer and judge. Uh, that's how he rose up. And remember, you didn't have to pay for law school at this time. You would have simply apprentice yourself to a well-to-do, um, well-connected lawyer and just work under his tutelage for a while, and the bar would eventually accept you. Uh, it was that kind of egalitarian back then. This was before the progressive movement made it much more institutionalized and difficult to become a lawyer uh, through uh, you know, um, formal schooling. So at any rate, he was seen as a self-made man uh, when he had uh, so many duels. Uh, my goodness, this guy uh, had quite a few of them and was uh, literally took life and almost had his life taken from him in these duels. Uh, his type of, of uh, fiery frontier temperament and even his Manichaean outlook that there is simply right versus wrong, good versus evil. There's no nuance. There's no shady gray. Uh, there's no complexity to things. Uh, that was all seen as being the product of the Tennessee uh, frontier. And so what had been seen as, you know, arguably scum of the earth just a generation before was seen as salt of the earth 
during Andrew Jackson's time period. His timing was perfect uh, coming from this demographic. So at any rate, they uh, another demographic besides Native Americans that suffered uh, were the wealthy and the well-to-do, et cetera. They oftentimes were voted out of office. Um, the National Bank, uh, which was, uh, ended its charter, the, the second National Bank was from 1816 to 1836. 1836, Andrew Jackson uh, refused to uh, re-sign its charter. And instead, he encouraged that money to go to local, uh, what they were called, wildcat banks. Uh, that gave easy, uh, affordable loans uh, to uh, to average common voters, and that's exactly what they wanted, right? Because it takes money to make money, and and by by having uh, easy access to loans, that was your way to the American dream: to purchase land, uh, to purchase feed, etc., for your farm, and uh, and get started uh, as some type of an entrepreneur, some type of business owner. And so he was giving the voters what they wanted, uh, easy credit, um, Native Americans' lands, and then also another demographic that, that suffered were African Americans. A lot of voters were either indifferent to or, or promote, promoted um, slavery. And so he, of course, you know, owned slaves. And um, granted, he tried to hide the fact that he was a slave trader because already by the 1830s, that was becoming a little bit taboo because of the abolitionist movement. But it was still popular enough that it did not hurt him ec uh, economically. It did not hurt him politically uh, as far as winning election and re-election uh, rather overwhelmingly. So at any rate, that's why I have at the top, be careful what you ask for, right? Because yes, arguably relative to the generation before them, in the 1820s and 1830s, Americans politically, institutionally, and also culturally uh, became more democratic than they were before. Um, but what that not that is not necessarily a good thing uh, because look at the way that the majority uh, became tyrannical over the numerical minorities. All right, so are there any questions? No questions, Professor. Yes. No, I said no questions. I was just answering you. Sure. All right. And so, uh, yeah, and, and as you could probably see, uh, in the time of cancel culture um, and the woke movement, et cetera, now, uh, you could probably see why uh, there are quite a few factions in, in contemporary politics who want to take Andrew Jackson off the $20 bill. Indian fighter, slave owner, offered easy credit to his voters, offered Native American land to his voters, opportunity to own slaves, Etc. All right. So, um, can I get a thumbs up from anyone? As far as you know, uh, you're you're here with me. Thank you, Angelica. Thank you, Joanne. Okay, Trisel. Thank you. All right. So, um, yeah. I mean, if you guys don't have any other questions, that's basically it. I wanted to just give context to this assignment. Notice it's just one section. Uh, but I think it's it's kind of clear what what the the thesis is meant to convey, right? Uh, I think the 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 um, the title says a lot, right? Increase democracy. Uh, be careful what you ask for. All right. So if you don't have any other questions, I'm I'm finished. If that's okay. I hope you guys have a nice week and do well on this assignment. And I will, um, you guys are due for me to catch up on some assignments uh, grading as well. So you could expect that soon as well. Okay, great, right. thank you, have a good afternoon. You too, Jolene, thank you.
Thank you. I appreciate you being so thorough. Uh, it helped a lot. Good. I hope so. Thank you, Savan. I appreciate that. Your input. All right. So you guys have a great one, okay? I'm going to go ahead and let you go. June, everyone, I hope you're well.